Just when you thought you might have mastered the C Sharp language, Microsoft changes the game and releases C Sharp 12. Yep, C Sharp 12 has landed and with it comes five really cool new features that you need to know about. Now, I'm not certain if every developer is going to love all these new syntax changes as potentially some of them may require you to make certain trade-offs within your coding standards. Spoiler. So buckle up as there's a lot to unpack within the next 15 minutes. Stick around to learn everything you need to know in order to get started with all these new features. And first, we're going to start the ball rolling, quickly considering should you actually upgrade to C-Sharp 12 now or not. First, let's start with the essential facts that you need to know. So c -sharp 12 was released alongside .NET 8 in Q4 2023. Now, the easiest way to get started with .NET 8 is to head over to the Microsoft.NET page, download the installer and run it. Now, after doing this, you'll also need to upgrade your version of Visual Studio 2022 so it can make use of .NET 8. Now, another important fact is that .NET 8 is an LTS release or long term supported release. Now, an LTS release will be supported by Microsoft for a minimum of three years, while standard term supported versions of .NET will only be supported for six months after the previous major or minor release. Now, if you're starting on a brand new project, basically just use the latest version of .NET regardless. And if you're working on a legacy system and you don't have the resources to update your applications every single time a .NET release comes out, then the recommendation is to only upgrade whenever a new OTS release is made. So basically, this means that .NET 8 should be a go-to installation and upgrade for all projects, new or old. We're starting off with my second favorite feature in this bunch, and that is a collection expression. So a collection expression is a new syntax which will create a uniform way for you to create new arrays, lists, spans, and innumerables. When it comes to creating arrays, lists, and spans in .NET, we have a bunch of different syntaxes that we can use. But just in terms of an array, we could define a string array by pressing new string here. Alternatively, actually, that string's optional, so we can skip it. Alternatively, as long as we're declaring it on the left-hand side here, we can completely skip it here and just use the object initializer. Now, when it comes to creating a list, we don't really have that luxury, so we just have to do a new list string and then pass stuff in with our curly braces in an object initializer. And alternatively, if we want to create a span, we can then do a stack alloc right here and we can pass stuff in. Now, I'm not sure about you, but having all this different syntax isn't ideal. Now, personally, I don't really use arrays that often, but I always seem to forget the syntax. And this is where collection expressions can help. Right, now let's take a look at how we can use this new syntax to define an array. Now we're going to start off and things are going to look very similar. So we're going to define the type we want to create. Now I'm just going to give it a name. And then finally, we can assign it a value. Now, the big difference in this code, hopefully you'll see, is that this here is using square brackets and this is using a curly brace. Now, on first glance, you might be thinking, big deal. Why do I need four different ways of creating an array? Why can't I just use the existing technique? Well, the benefit of the collection expression starts coming in when you want to work with different types as well. So let's say that I want to create a list. I can now do my list and I can define it in exactly the same way. Let's say that I want to create a span. I can also do the thing exactly the same and I've got exactly the same syntax now to define everything. Now, this is pretty cool. However, there's more to come. The next really cool thing around collection expressions is around concatenation with different types. So let's say that I wanted to combine all the items in my lists together. So let's say I'm going to call a new type. I'm going to call it combine. So what I can do is use the spread operator, which is dot dot, and then I can pass in my array name. I can then use the spread operator on my list. And then I can also use a spread operator on my span. There we go. Now, if I trigger this code, what we'll see is that within my array, I've now got nine items and everything's been added. 
Now, for me, this is one of the best new features of C Sharp. I love the fact that I can have a uniform way of defining my arrays and my lists. Also means I don't need to worry about the square bracket, curly bracket notation anymore. Being able to use the spread operator is something I love because I've done a lot of JavaScript. I also love the fact that I can change different types without having to mess around with extension methods or coming up with different utilities. So for me, this is one of the best features of C Sharp 12, and I think this is gonna make your life much, much easier moving forward. The next feature is gonna make things a little bit easier for you the next time that you need to create a Lambda. Now, the reason for this is that you can now create default values and parameters within lambdas. So within the new world, whenever you're defining a lambda, you've now got the option of adding in a default value like this. So this works exactly the same as when we were defining new methods. All we need to do is initialize any kind of params we want to work with, assign them default values, and then if within our expression, nothing assigns a value to my string, this default value will be used. And underneath here, you can see that we've got the value because nothing's being done to my string here at all. So the big payoff for here for using this syntax is that you now no longer need to use local functions or set default values in the Lambda body itself. Instead, you can define everything in initialization, making your code that much more easier to understand. Now, because we're on YouTube, I'm obviously going to leave some of the better features to last. So the next feature I want to talk about is inline arrays. Now, this is a bit of a weird one because in all likelihood, you're never going to need to use an inline array. However, moving on in the future, it's likely that your code is going to benefit from these in the long run. So before I talk about why inline arrays exist, it's probably useful for me to walk you through the code to create one. I mean, I don't think you ever will, but it's worthwhile anyway. So an inline array is defined by using an attribute and that attribute can be found in system runtime compiler services inline array. Now, because we're creating an array, we obviously need to find an area in memory and how many spaces we need to create. So in this example, every single time someone creates my custom inline array, it's always gonna be assigned two spots in memory. Now, another key bit about this code is that it's using a struct and this really is the key bit. Now, aside from that, all the newing up stuff is pretty simple. We give it a name as we always do. You can use generics and type things so you can pass in T, but you don't have to. And then we need a private field here to store all of our information in memory. Simple as that. So hopefully you found that code pretty simplistic. Now let's compare this inline array to normal arrays so we can see why they actually exist. So we're inside of this method I created and then on line 19, I've just basically defined a normal array. So forget about syntax, but you can see I'm doing a new string array here and I'm defining it to have two elements when it's initialized. Now, in order to create an inline array, we just need to new up that type we've created. I'm gonna pass in string as my T. And remember in the background, this is also gonna create an array with two items. Now, aside from this, everything's gonna be exactly the same between our array and our inline array. So all the inputs that you add, they're gonna work exactly the same. All the outputs are exactly the same. So if we just use this bit of code of reading in values and writing them out, you're gonna have the same inputs and outputs for inline arrays and normal arrays. So I think it's a fair question to say, if the inputs and the outputs are the same, what's the point in going to all that extra effort to create an inline array in the first place? And the answer to this is performance. Now, under the hood, because we're using a struct, whenever you're using an inline array, it's gonna be stored on the stack and it's probably gonna run a little bit quicker. Now, if you're using a normal array, a collection, a list, this is gonna be put on the heap because it's a reference type. And basically, this is the main thing. Now, unless your application's biggest bottleneck is because the way your arrays are being stored on disk is causing everything to slow down a little bit, you're never going to need to use this feature. The next feature is called alias any type, and it's gonna level up what you can do with using statements inside of your classes. Now, typically when you're using a using statement, you're probably trying to reference a class, a type, an interface from some other place so you can use it and import it within your current class. 
Now, it's also possible to use aliases with your using statements. However, it's been limited by what you can alias previously. So the big change here is that from C Sharp 12 onwards, you can now create aliases that reference other things like tuples, nullable types, and method signatures. And the benefit of being able to alias using these additional types is the ability to reduce duplication and improve code readability within your classes. So this all sounds great. Let's see a few examples in action. Now in the new world, as you can see on line one, it's now possible to create an alias for things like coordinates. So using a tuple, you can pass in an X and Y. On the second line, you can see that I've created an alias for a nullable int. Now, personally, I like fluent APIs. I like declarative code. So I think being able to reference code using this in a human readable format is much easier than just having this code syntax. Finally, I could even define an array. So I can define my array here as a string array and I can reuse this in my code. So let's look at all of this in action. You can see here in my method, I'm passing in my alias. In line 10 here, I'm checking my pram. I'm checking it for a nullable int. On line 12, I'm creating a new coordinate by newing up my alias. Finally, on line 18, you can see that I'm creating a new array using a collection expression by passing in my type and then just assigning it some values. And this could be a nicer shortcut if you had to create multiple arrays of the same type over and over again. The last remaining official feature is probably my favorite feature in this list. However, I also think it's probably the most controversial one and it's called primary constructors. So yes, that was a bold claim. Now let's look at how primary constructors can help us refactor this class. Now this class should hopefully look fairly familiar to anyone who's been doing .NET because this is the way that we've been creating classes with constructors ever since .NET was released. Now, obviously, when we're creating code in an object oriented language, the class is the linchpin of how everything works. So we define a class using a modifier here, using the keyword class and then giving our class a name. And then to create a constructor, we'd create a public constructor. We'd marry up the name here with our class name. And then within here, we can pass in different arguments. And then for maybe 80, 90 percent of the time, all we're doing within this constructor is mapping our incoming thing to something within our class. So in this example, I'm mapping something to a public property. However, often you'll be mapping things to private fields. Now, obviously, I don't know how your projects are structured, but personally, for me, that example there pretty much sums up, say, 70 to 90 percent of my constructors. Most of the time, all I'm really doing is injecting stuff using dependency injection and then mapping it to some sort of property inside the class itself. Now, this means I have to write a bunch of boring boilerplate code when I'm creating constructors. And this is where the primary constructor feature comes in to simplify things. So basically, a primary constructor is a new shorthand syntax which will reduce the amount of boilerplate code that you need to write whenever you need to create a constructor. And to demonstrate this new feature, we're going on a slight refactoring journey. So I've got an example of how we would create a class with a normal constructor. So we're defining our class, we're defining a constructor, we're passing in some sort of dependency, and then we're mapping it to a private read-only field so it could be used throughout the remainder of this class. Cool, so now let's take that example and refactor it using a primary constructor. So in order to modify this class to use a primary constructor, we'll take our incoming arguments, we'll paste them at the end of our class declaration, we'll then delete everything else, and that's our code converted to using a primary constructor. I hope we can agree this is much cleaner. Now, yep, at the beginning, I did say that primary constructors could be seen as controversial, and that code example was pretty simple. And this is the kicker. If you're just simply mapping incoming dependency to private fields, primary constructors is a nice syntax. However, if you need to do more complicated things in your classes and constructors, then there are some caveats that you need to be aware of. Now, to keep this video short, I'm not going to go into all of those nuances here. Instead, I've recorded a 10 minute video that's going to be released next week, which covers all the little caveats you need to be aware of. Now, the spoiler is they're still great features. However, there's definitely things you need to be aware of if you're using them and doing code reviews. So watch that video. I should link to it on screen after it's out. So the link will be there.
There is one final unofficial feature to mention, Inceptors. Now, the reason why I say unofficial is that Inceptors are being released as experimental slash preview within C Sharp 12. So this means Inceptors are not turned on by default and you will need to explicitly enable them in config before you can use them. Now, before doing that though, just remember, like all experimental .NET features, Inceptors may completely change or be completely removed in future versions. So it's probably best not to use Inceptors in your production code quite yet. Now, the next question you probably have is, what's an Inceptor? Well, as the name implies, an Inceptor is a method that can substitute calls to existing methods. Now, at compile time, you can define some code that will overwrite existing methods. Now, this substitution occurs by having the interceptor declare the source location of the call that it wants to intercept on boot up. Now, if you control all your own code, then interceptors might not be too useful. However, if you're a package creator or a compiler designer, if you need to release or update changes to existing code, then interceptors will give you more flexibility. Now, as Interceptors are not an officially released feature, I'm not going to get into the weeds of how Interceptors work in this video. Instead, if you wait two weeks, I'm going to do a specific 10 minute deep dive video covering everything you need to know about Interceptors. So you're just going to have to wait till then. So that pretty much is everything that you need to know about C Sharp 12 to start using it today. Now, what are your thoughts on C Sharp 12? Do you think this is a solid release or do you think it's a bit of lackluster compared to previous attempts? Now, for me personally, I am loving the collection expressions. I'm also loving the primary constructors. Now, in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to do a deep dive into some .NET 8 stuff and look at some of these features in more detail. So if you haven't already, hit subscribe right now because I do weekly videos that will help you to become a better developer. Now, if you have got value from this video or you've liked it in any way, don't forget to sign up to my free newsletter, link below, hit the like button, smash a bell and basically do anything to help me out. Now, if you want to learn more about C Sharp and Visual Studio before we part ways, then on the screen right now, there's a link to a video that I recorded, which goes over the best hidden features in Visual Studio that I bet you don't know about. Now, these tips are going to make it quicker for you to write code. So check that out because I bet you'll learn something you didn't know. So aside from that, hope you're having a great day. And until next Sunday, happy coding.